This evening is dedicated to the gliders, the glider pilots, and of course the connection of Minnesota to that. Uh, as you know, uh, Jim, Jim, what was it? 12% uh, of the gliders were built here in Minnesota, about 1,500. So, so a good number were built here. And uh, if, you, if you look at where the uh, control tower is at the airport today, that was the DePonte hangar where the uh, production started. Uh, uh, we worked to get a proclamation from the state of Minnesota, and I do want to read that uh, to you. Proclamation. Whereas the successful use of gliders by Nazi Germany to capture the Belgian fort of Ibani Mall in May of 1940 opened a new element of warfare, and in February 41, the United States Army decided to develop its own glider force. And whereas before the gliders could be delivered, 18 training sites were selected, including three in Minnesota. Uh, as gliders were made available, the main training site was established at the South Plains Army Airfield in Lubbock, Texas where over 6,000 pilots were qualified by the end of the war. A maintenance and repair training facility was established at Shepherd Army Airfield in Texas, and a transport carrier training facility was, was established at Whiteman uh, Army Airfield in Missouri. And whereas during World War II, a total of 12,909 CG-4 gliders were built, with 1,509 coming out of Northwestern Aeronautical Corporation in the Twin Cities, a total of uh, 100 <coughs> larger CG-13 gliders were also built, with 50 coming from Northwest Aeronautics. And whereas the gliders were utilized during military operation, operations in Sicily, Normandy, Southern France, Holland, uh, Bastogne, uh, Operation Varsity in Europe, Gliders were also deployed by the commandos in the China-Burma-India campaign and by the 11th Air Airborne in recapturing the Philippines. <clears throat> and at the end of World War II, the production of gliders ceased and utilize, utilization of gliders in combat uh, doctrine ended. And whereas on um, October 2nd, 2014, the surviving and dedicated glider pilots and other affiliated troop carrier service members continue to honor their contributions to victory at a gathering in Bloomington, Minnesota. Therefore, signed this date, uh, Governor of Minnesota, Mark Dayton, uh, will be reading the proclamation giving that to the uh, glider pilots and, uh, again, uh, dedication for them to come here and a big welcome to Minnesota. Thank you. <laughs> Our speaker this evening is uh, Guy LaFaro. Um, Guy, this, this is Guy's second trip here, and I, I found out his brother is actually head of the uh, mathematics department at Gustavus Adolphus. I didn't know that until today. <laughs> but uh, Guy came here several winters ago on a December. Uh, we, we did a Battle of the Bulge program. And I know that the 101st Airborne says that they won the Battle of the Bulge. Guy did a wonderful job of pointing out the contribution of the 82nd Airborne in blunting the Piper advance uh, coming out of uh, uh, the German spearhead. And um, when we needed somebody that knows something about Airborne as uh, uh, as evidenced by his book on the 82nd, uh, he, he was the guy to come. And uh, I know he's got a brand new book coming out too that we'll have to talk to him about uh, down the road. Guy uh, grew up in um, St. Louis. He graduated from West Point. Uh, he taught at West Point, uh, spent 23 years uh, mainly in uh, 82nd Special Forces, Rangers, and a bunch of spook stuff that he said he'd have to kill me if, if he told me what it was about. But uh, it's been a delight to have him here for the second time. And um, one of the things that, that this roundtable is about 
is not only teaching history, but it's about building relationships of all you people here and with our uh, speakers coming in. Guy, can you tell us about the gliders in World War II and how they helped win the war? Thanks for coming out, especially given the fact that the Vikings are playing the Packers this evening. I expected there to be about five, ten people here this evening. But thanks for taking the time. I, I, I promise I won't speak too long. And thanks for Don uh, and, the, and the entire roundtable crew for inviting me again. As Don st said, I, was, I think I was here about three years ago. And, and it was so cold, I thought I was going to cry. I'm from Atlanta, so we're not used to this down there. Uh, but when he asked to come back, I, I said yes for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's not February, which is when it was last time. But the real reason I came back is because this is a class organization. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, they do a great job here. I have had the opportunity to speak at a lot of venues, both military, government, and civilian, academic. And this is one of the best there is. This is truly one of the best there is. The only thing that comes close to approaching this, in my experience, if any of you have been to uh, Fort Bragg in Fayetteville outside, you may have visited the Airborne and Special Ops Museum out, outside, the ASOM. It's kind of an odd museum. It's owned by uh, the Department of Defense, but it's in the city of Fayetteville because there's so much secret stuff on Fort Bragg that they don't want civilians coming in there walking around. So they put it outside the gate. They have a great they have a great uh, venue as well. This one is every bit as good as that one. So my hat's off to Don and his crew for, uh, for having this. Sure. Now, I'd like to do something tonight that uh, uh, I learned early on that you should never do. And, that, and, and that's how I'm going to start, by breaking the rules. Uh, I'm going to tell you what I'm not going to spe speak about this evening. Anybody who has ever taken a public speaking course will tell you, and you know, that that's not what you're supposed to do. Right? But that's one of the reasons I went into Special Forces, because you don't have to follow rules, like, like shaving. So what I'm not going to speak about at length tonight is the aircraft themselves. I'm not going to be able to talk to you about the various models and makes of the World War II combat gliders, how they were manufactured, where they were manufactured, what they were manufactured out, out uh, from. Even though I, went, I am a graduate of America's first engineering school, West Point, I am uh, somewhat of a disappointment to West Point when it comes to technology. So that's one reason that I'm not going to talk to you about the makes of the gliders themselves. There are three other reasons I'm not going to talk about those, those things. And you've already met two of them. One is Philippe, and the other is Sarah. I had dinner with them last night, and they know more about gliders and where they're manufactured than anyone I know. Their parlor game is like uh, serial number glider 4627. Where was that manufactured? Oh, Ford Motor Company in the Upper Peninsula. Who knows that stuff? And I can't compete. But, but that's two. The third reason, and the guy who really scares me, is Mr. Day over here. This guy knows every glider ever built anywhere in the world. So I'm not going to give him the opportunity to correct me. But really, these, these, these people know, know a, a wealth about gliders and the specifics of, uh, specifics of gliders and glider operations and where they landed. Philippe, in fact, lives in southern France where, the, uh, where uh, the, the invasion of southern France occurred. And he spends his off time looking around the glider landing zones. Am I not right, Philippe? And one other thing that you're, we're going to talk about tonight is how fragile these things were. And if you see Philippe afterward, he actually has some, uh, some actual, but the skin and some of the, uh, the plywood, very flimsy wood, out of which these uh, gliders were made. And he will, he will show that to you, share that with you. It's, it's just amazing that these things could fly. So that's what I'm not going to talk about, because I'm really afraid of Mr. Day. What I am going to talk about 
is this poster, or at least the idea behind this poster. Now, these, these glider guys, these glider heroes, they probably know all about this poster. You can see it's hard to make out, but those pictures, those pictures are of broken slash crashed gliders. So this is uh, somewhat of a backhanded recruiting poster for getting people to join the glider troops. And really, this is, this is a, a poster that was posted in the barracks of the glider tro troops, kind of tongue in cheek, saying, hey, isn't this great? We don't get any extra pay, but we get to travel in these things that often end up looking like that. <laughs> now, it's somewhat funny. But you have to ask yourself, why? What's the idea behind this thing? What's the mindset that develops these gliders or that, or that gives rise to kind of a mocking poster like this? In my mind, the men who flew in these gliders, the glider troopers, and the men who flew these gliders, the glider pilots, were for most of the war marginalized. They had one of the most dangerous jobs of anybody in the war, and yet they weren't appreciated for it. Moreover, looking back at the American airborne effort of World War II, you realize, when taken in its totality, that it doesn't work without glider pilots and glider troops. Obviously, it doesn't work with gliders either, but as I told you, I'm not going there. <laughs> These guys, the pilots and the troopers, were an essential pillar of the American airborne experience of World War II. And the Americans are able to form and forge a new form of warfare, vertical envelopment, because of contributions by men like these, the pilots and the troopers themselves. And of course, the paratroopers as well. But as I will t speak about in a little bit, paratroopers could not have done what they did without glider troopers to back them up. The 82nd Airborne Division would not have been as successful as it was had it not been for the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment and all the other glider-borne elements that were a part of that division. Simply would not have happened. Now, I've never been in a glider in flight. I've been in a couple of helicopter crashes which is the closest thing that I can think of to being in a, in a glider. These helicopters lost power. We came down. Thankfully, nobody was uh, seriously injured. We all walked away. Had some great pilots to get us down. But I have to tell you that I was, uh, that I was a little scared when that was happening. The first time it happened, I was a second lieutenant. And I thought, I just got here. As I say, in my experience, it's the closest I, I, think I, could, I, I think there is today of, without actually being in a glider, of being in a combat glider in World War II. Why? And they may take issue with this, but this is from a, an outsider looking in. Landing a glider in combat is really a controlled crash. It's really a controlled crash. I mean, think about it. First of all, you're towed hundreds of miles behind a powered aircraft at the end of, a, of a, a rope, a nylon rope that is what, maybe 200 feet, 250 feet long? How, how long? 350, see? Mr. Day. <laughs> 350, 350 feet long. Now, it, in my experience, these, ha these things had an un unusual aspect to them, which is they would often break before they got, you got there and you're in a glider. You can't do anything but land. It's not like you can pull pitch and get out of there. You're going down. Many times, though, these things, these, these uh, tow ropes, tow cables, tow ropes, would, would break when the glider was over water. So you're landing, except you're landing in the middle of the Mediterranean or the English Channel, and hoping that there is a friendly vessel nearby to pick you up. Gliders also had, and I don't know how often this happened, but I seem to read about it an awful lot, gliders also had this propensity to, I don't know, disintegrate in midair. Their wings would come off, or the nose, their nose would flip up, their nose would come out and unlatched, and, and it, 
you'd be flying along and all of a sudden your nose is, is open. Who wants to go into battle in one of those things? And then when you get to the battle zone, you're released from your toe at the release point, And then you have to find a place to land. Now generally, what you, obviously what you want is something that's relatively flat, relatively long, and free of obstacles. That's not what you're going to find in combat. It's not what you find in Normandy, or Holland, or in Germany. Because the Germans knew you were coming, they put up obstacles. And if you weren't the first guy in the, uh, oh, by the way, if you weren't the first guy on the ground, guess what other obstacle there was? Other gliders. So you had to fly all around those. And if you go, if you take a look at what Philippe brought, you'll see that there's not a lot of protection. These are unarmed, unarmored, unpowered aircraft coming in for a landing. And then, according to my reading again, one of the most efficacious ways of bringing a glider to a sudden and relatively safe landing was to fly close to a tree and have the tree shear your wings off. Really? That's how you're going to land? That's what these guys did as a matter of course. They were incredibly brave, both the men who flew them and the men who flew in them. And believe it or not, some women going into the uh, Boston. Walter Cronkite take a, took a look at what was going on, and he said this, don't do it. <laughs> now you would think, because this is such hair-raising stuff, that this is so dangerous, that this is the kind of stuff that only a select few do. People like, you know, we, we see our action movies today and people doing weird stuff and, and generally everybody's, you know, a ranger or special forces or SEAL Team 6 or something like that. And you expect crazy stuff of, this, of those guys. This gives you a flavor of how big these, this was. This was a large operation. There were a lot of these guys. Now, these figures are not exact, Mr. Day. <laughs> But they are there, they're close. Are they close? OK. <laughs> they're close. And why I, I, I present them to you is to give you an idea of how big this was. 1,600 gliders going into Operation Market. That's the Market Garden operation. That's the bridge too far, the, the jump into Holland by the 82nd, 101st, and British 1st Airborne. Dragoon is the invasion of southern France. Neptune is actually the, the code name for the actual invasion of, of Normandy. I know we often hear of it as Operation Overlord, but the, the assault portion of it is actually uh, Neptune. And Varsity is the drop across the Rhine at the end of the war. Now these are not all the glider operations that occurred during the war. These are not all the American glider operations that occurred during the war. As, uh, as Don said, there was one on, in the Philippines. But these are the major ones, at least in my book. Now, the Bulge was a really a resupply mission. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Burma was, not a lot of people know about what happens in Burma, but this was actually a, in support of Wingate's Chindits, which is a long-range penetration group. And these guys, these pilots were incredible. They would land and then take off again. A little bit more about that later. How do you take off in a glider? That's another thing. So as you can see, this glider effort was quite large. It was quite large, but as I stated, maligned. Maligned in the ways like that poster showed. This is a statement from an official Army Air Force document. In fact, this is like the second, no, this is the first sentence of the first chapter of that official Army Air Force document. Now notice a couple of words, controversial. This is a controversial program. Specifically, they're talking about the glider pilot training program in this document, but they call it controversial. And notice also, it didn't take the Air Corps long to come to this conclusion that it was controversial. Now controversial, that's a code name for, ah, we're, real not, we're not real sure about this stuff. Now here's a little bit more information. This is from Army Air Force's historical study number one. The Army Air Force decides they're going to do a series of historical studies. 
they do throughout the course of the war, about 150 of them. The first one they do is on the glider pilot training program. And this is the conclusion they come to. Notice the date, September 1943. The Army Air Force has not really used gliders in combat yet, and they've already determined that it's controversial. Now, we can talk about Sicily. Sicily was a, kind of a hybrid thing. It was really a British operation with American gliders and some American glider pilots. But in essence, and that was in July of 43, but in September of 43, when this thing is published, the Army Air Force has already decided it's controversial and it doesn't like it. The question is, why? Now, with the exception of the three people who I've, I've picked out here, there's, there's going to be a quiz. And those three people can't answer this. Does anybody know who this guy is? <sighs> right, right. Giulio Duhay or Douay. My, my Italian is really bad. And he's an Italian general. And in 1921, he writes this book called Command of the Air. Now, if any of you uh, have service in the Air Force, you've probably heard of Duhay and his book. It is the touchstone of air power. Now, Duhay says, and these are two excerpts from his book, and I've, I've kind of uh, uh, re made and uh, read the, the, the important parts. Area warfare will be the most important element in future wars. Area warfare, not ground warfare, not naval warfare. It's going to be area warfare. The last line of that first paragraph, too, I know we're skipping the last line. The importance of the Army and Navy will decrease in proportion. Why? Because how are you going to wage wars in the future? Well, that's in the second paragraph. You're going to bomb the enemy civilian population. The enemy civilian population today, tomorrow, and the next day until they compel their political leaders to sue for peace. That's how you're going to win the war. And oh, by the way, if you're going to do this, what do you need? The independent Air Force. He writes this in 1921. And this becomes the mantra for the Army Air Corps, or the Army Air Service, as it's called that time. It later becomes the Army Air Forces during World War II. Now, as I'm sure all of you know, that until 1947, there was no independent US Air Force. It was an appendage of the US Army, and they did not like being an appendage of the US Army. Duhay gives them a reason and a path forward to becoming its own in, their own independent force. They can win wars by themselves. Therefore, we should be an independent service. Now, Duhay's book is incredibly influential in the interwar years really makes a big splash, especially in America and in Great Britain. Perhaps the guy who, who best summarizes the idea and the most remembered phrase about Duhay's book, about Duhay's theories, was not uttered or written by Duhay himself. It was uttered by Stanley Baldwin. This is a speech he gave before the House of Commons in 1932 when the House of Commons is, try, is debating how it should spend its money. And Baldwin, who was Prime Minister of England three times in the interwar years, says in red, the bomber will always get through. What's he saying? There's no way to stop a bomber. And what's going to happen in future wars is that bomb, bombing forces, strategic bombing forces, these are forces made up of long-range bombers that can carry lots of bombs, are going to fly to the enemy country, they're going to bomb the civilian population, and the civilian population is then going to force its political leaders to sue for peace. That's what's going to happen. So, Baldwin says, we don't have a lot of money. What money we can spend on defense, we should spend on buying bombers. Now, the RAF at this time, the Royal Air Force, they're already an independent force. The Army Air Force, or the Army Air Service, is not. As I said, it's an appendage of the Army. And as an appendage, the Army, the ground force, wants it to support the ground force. The air power guys don't want to do that. They want to be a strategic force all its own. They believe what Duhay has to say. They buy into what Stanley Baldwin has said, that strategic bombing can win wars by itself. 
In fact, they believe it so fervently that the number one spokesman for the Army, uh, Army Air Service, Army Air Force, Army Air Service, Billy Mitchell, is court-martialed in 1925 for speaking out against President Coolidge. He says here, and I quote, he, I, accuse, I accuse them, the treasonable administration of national defense. When a serving general officer says that about the commander in chief, there's only one option, that's court martial. Billy Mitchell is court martialed, but the idea does not go away. And throughout the interwar years and through World War II, the Army Air Force forces is wedded to this idea of strategic bomb bombardment. Think about it. Who are the major generals of World War II? Spatz, Doolittle, LeMay, Eaker. What do all those guys do? How they make their names? Bombers, right? This is idea that persists. It persists in the, during the Eisenhower administration. During the Eisenhower administration, the, we, we uh, institute the doctrine of massive retaliation. Massive retaliation is really a theory of war that decides who's going to get the most money in the defense budget. Who gets the most defense money, money in the Eisenhower administration? The newly minted U.S. Air Force. And within the U.S. Air Force, 70%, 70% of the U.S. Air Force is in the Strategic Air Command. And what does the Strategic Air Command do? They deliver bombs. Just the other day, our U.S. Air Force decided that they're going to do away with an aircraft. One aircraft. Big controversy. Anybody know what aircraft that was? The A-10. The A-10 has one purpose. What is it? Kill tanks. It's a ground support weapon. It doesn't fit into strategic bombing paradigm. So you do away with it. This idea persists, and it did persist throughout World War II. So what I'm attempting to say to you is that these guys, the Air Army Air Force guys, the higher echelon guys, they were not enamored of the glider program because the glider program didn't fit into their paradigm. It didn't fit into their desire to become an independent service. It didn't fit into this theory, this doctrine of strategic bombardment. And yet, and yet, as I showed you before, the glider program in the United States Army was relatively large. How do you reconcile those two things? Well, you reconcile them because this strategic uh, bombing idea comes face to face with another idea. It's an idea started by these two guys. Probably everybody knows the guy on the right, all right? Kurt Student. How about the guy on the left? Marshal Tukhachevsky. Let's start with Tukhachevsky. Tukhachevsky comes up with a brilliant idea. It's called Deep Battle. Essentially what he says is instead of bludgeoning your forces against the front lines of the enemy, what you need to do is find some way to get into the enemy's rear, disrupt his command control and communications and logistics, so fear, fear and confusion in his ranks, and that way you make the front lines, the enemy's front lines, more brittle and more susceptible to collapse. Deep battle. It's actually still a doctrine in the Russian army. Now he thinks there are two ways to do this. The one way is to develop mobile forces that can either penetrate the enemy's defenses and get into his rear and spread out and sow this panic and confusion, or using these same mobile forces, develop a way to get around the enemy forces, to envelop them and get into their rear. That's one way to do it. You use tanks, trucks, armored cars, armored uh, half tracks to do that. Another way is to go over the enemy's front line defenses to vertically envelop him. And that's the key phrase, vertical envelopment. That's the competing doctrine. Vertical envelopment versus strategic bombing. And vertical envelopment has a corollary that is called strategic mobility. A little bit more about that later. I don't mean to bore you with all these terms, but they're kind of important for the story. So Tukhachevsky says, you develop these forces that can go over the enemy defenses, vertically envelop the, the enemy. And you can do that via parachute, via glider, or via air-landed units, air-landed infantry on fields that you capture. Now, as a result of Tukhachevsky's idea, the Red Army develops a massive parachute and glider program during the interwar years. 
By the late 1930s, they have about 29 parachute battalions, thousands of glider pilots, I think 10 glider stations, which is a place where you go practice gliding. And they've done these massive exercises, massive exercises that involve parachute troops and glider troops and air-landed troops. And they invite all the world to come, hey, look what we've done. This stuff is great. Some people not very impressed. The British, not very impressed. But the one guy who was impressed was the other guy on this slide. Now, let, let, before we leave Tukhachevsky, the, the Russians never used this capability in World War II in massive numbers. In essence, their airborne forces are relegated to commando missions, small-scale raids, inserting partisans and stuff like that. They never, they never do that. Why? Because Tukhachevsky, brilliant man, and the people he had around him were a threat to Stalin. So in 1937, Tukhachevsky is executed, along with most of the higher ranking officers in the Red Army. Student is a uh, Luftwaffe officer. At the time, uh, between the wars, he's, an, uh, he's a colonel. Now, he had been commissioned as an infantryman before the start of the First World War. He learned to fly, and then during the First World War, he really spent his time as a pilot. He seriously wounded during the war, sits out the last part of it, and we all know that what happens after World War I is we're never going to let Germany do that again. So we don't give Germany an army. We give them a 100,000 man a Reichswehr, as it's called. We also don't give them an air force. Now, student is able to stay in the, this Reichswehr over, uh, during the interwar years. And he secretly visits Russia. Now, Germany had a secret pact with Russia. There, there was this organization called the Allied Con Control Commission, which was a League of Nations organization that would roam around Germany, making sure that the Germans weren't violating the uh, tenets of the Versailles Treaty, that they weren't secretly building an air force or a navy or submarines, or that they had 100,001 men. Right? So in order to escape the watchful eyes of the Allied Contro Control Commission, the Germans and the Russians have this secret pact. The Germans say, we'll come over there and we'll help you modernize your force if you allow us to use the lands of Russia to experiment with. We experiment with tanks and communications and, oh, by the way, airborne warfare. We're going to experiment over there because the Allied Control Commission is not looking for Germans breaking the law in Russia. They're looking for Germans breaking the law in Germany. So it works. And student takes to this idea of vertical envelopment. And in fact, student develops the first airborne division, the seventh airborne division or seventh flieger division. And in two stunning moves, he demonstrates the capabilities of this in the opening years of World War II. The first has already been mentioned, this fort at Ibani Mal. It sits at the juncture of the Meuse, and the, uh, Meuse River and the Albert Canal. Now, why is this important? It's important because the Germans need to take this. They need to get across the Meuse and the Albert Canal in order to entice the Allies to move into Belgium. And when the Allied forces move into Belgium, they then be cut off and destroyed by another German force. But in order to entice the Allies into Belgium, you have to have a credible threat. In order to have a credible threat, you have to get off the Meuse. And in order to get across the Meuse, you have to reduce this fort which is the strongest fort in Europe at that time. The strongest fort in Europe. Stronger than anything in the Maginot Line. It was thought to be all but impregnable. Several stories underground. Soldiers, a, a, a quite, a sizable, uh, uh, quite a sizable garrison. I say they're the garrison of 650. The garrison of 650 is actually about how many guys were there on the 10th of May, 1940. That's the day that the, out, that the Germans invaded the West. It actually could hold a, a quite a bit, uh, at least a, a garrison twice that size. They just weren't all there on, on uh, the invasion day. And these 78 paratroopers and about 10 gliders using shape charges land on top of this fort, disable the guns that are in concrete casements and steel cupolas, and essentially lock those 650 guys underground for a couple of days until the rest of the German forces uh, uh, link up with them. A stunning coup. 
This takes the world by surprise. If you read the diaries and letters of the higher ranking American officers at that time, especially those officers who were involved in the American airborne effort, they are stunned by this. Now this isn't the first time that the Germans use paratroopers. It's also not the only time on, in the 10th of May 1940 that they use paratroopers or gliders. But this event stuns them. And it really forms the paradigm for what the Americans are looking at when they're developing an airborne force. And essentially that is small scale raiders. We're going to have like rangers or commandos who fly in in gliders or parachute out of planes and blow bridges up and then get out of there. You know, a combination of Sylvester Stallone and Jean-Claude Van Damme. Those kind of guys. All right? But then that changes in a year because student does it again. He invades Crete from the air, entirely from the air, using gliders, paratroopers, and air-landed mountain troops. He takes two divisions of soldiers from Greece, and he lands them on Crete, and he defeats a force that are about twice the size of his, as you can see there. Now, this is shock and awe of the First Order. Now, post-war accounts and post-war kind of reconciling of what, ha uh, what happened on Crete will, will uncover the fact that the reason the Germans were successful is because the Allies made a grave tactical error. And I won't bore you with the tactics of it, but let's just say that the Allies abandoned a position that they didn't need to abandon, thereby giving the advantage to the Germans. And the Germans took advantage of that opening. And consequently, they are able to defeat the Greek, New Zealand, and British soldiers on Crete. Chase them off of Crete. Chase them off of Crete. Everybody is astounded by this. Now, one of the things that also comes out after the war, again, the Allies don't know this, as they're looking from afar what the Germans are doing, is that the German parachute force is almost decimated at Crete. In fact, Hitler tells Student, the day of the paratroop has ended. We're never doing that again. And that has, that has wider ramifications for the war. For instance, Balta. But, uh, but the, again, the Americans don't know this. The British don't know this. They're looking at Crete, and they're saying, this is incredible. In fact, one guy says this. After these successful operations, I think it would indeed be dull of us to say that airborne troops will seldom be employed in units larger than a battalion. Now, the guy who says this is the fellow on the left, William C. Lee. Lee is General Marshall's point man in the American airborne effort. In 1939, Marshall gives him the mission. Hey, at the time, Lee, in this picture, he is a major general. He commands the, he later rises to command the 101st. But just before the D-Day invasion, he has a heart attack, is invalidated out of the army. His place is taken by Maxwell Taylor. But Lee is a major in 1939 on the War Department staff. He gets a memo from the chief of staff of the army. General Marshall says, essentially, hey, Lee, I want you to check out this airborne thing and Tell me what you think. Should we do it? Should we not? Now, airborne thing, nobody's, nobody in America really knows what that means. They don't know if it means paratroopers or gliders or air-landed troops. They don't know. It's airborne. It's just out there. Figure it out. And it's Lee's task to figure this out. And he develops this airborne force that at first, as a result of things like a Bonnie Mall, is designed to be a raider force, a ranger force, a commando force. It's going to be small. There's no airborne unit larger than a battalion. Now, if you don't have, and that includes glider units, if you don't have glider units that are larger than battalions, you don't need a whole hell of a lot of gliders, which is just fine with the Army Air Force, because they don't want to spend a lot of resources on gliders anyway. They want to build bombers and fighters. But then Crete happens. And Lee wrote that quote that I told you, and America decides it's going to start building airborne divisions. And we're going to exploit this vertical, uh, vertical envelopment idea. In fact, General Marshall is the chief proponent. He says that this is the one way that we can get ahead of the Germans. And we're going to not only develop the idea of vertical envelopment, we're going to take it a step further. We're going to develop this idea called strategic mobility, which is I've got this strike force that is so light yet so potent it can go any place and you have to defend everywhere. You, the Germans, you have to defend everywhere. Strategic mobility, never been done before. 
Not an idea that anybody thought of. This is deep battle taken to the, a whole new level. And the Germans, for, mu for much of the war, and you'll see this later on, are stunned, are almost, are almost petrified by this force in being, these airborne divisions that could land any place and in their rear, meaning they had to defend everywhere. Now, the other guy on this slide is James M. Gavin. I call him the Airborne Wunderkind. He's 37 years old and a division commander, two-star general. Now, as Don said, I spent a little bit of time in the Army. I was 37 years old. I was a captain. I didn't do as well as General Gavin. <laughs> Gavin is Lee's S3, or G3, at this organization called the Provisional Parachute Group, later Airborne Command. That's not important. But that, what's important about that is that it's these two guys coming together, thinking about this idea of strategic mobility, of vertical envelopment. How do we do that? What should our forces look like? We're going to develop these airborne divisions because the Germans just showed us that we can have division-sized airborne operations. We're going to develop these things. Gavin, in fact, is inspired by Stonewall Jackson. If anybody here is a Stonewall Jackson fan, you know one of Jackson's greatest campaigns is Second Manassas, or Second Bull Run, if you're from the North, where he gets behind Pope's army and sows what? Confusion and chaos in the enemy rear. Gavin, using the example of Stonewall Jackson, thinks, hey, we can do the same thing with airborne forces. If only we can get it right. But they're not sure how to get it right. They're reading these captured German after action reports. They're reading reports from the press. They're reading um, uh, translated Russian manuscripts on how to do this stuff. Gavin says in his diary, when somebody asked, actually it's an it's a, it's a interview he does after the war, they said, hey, General Gavin, how'd you come up with these ideas about airborne warfare? He said, I don't know, just made it up. I didn't know anything about it. Didn't know anything about it, just read about it, had my ideas about theory, spurred on by Lee, and these two develop airborne divisions. And consequently, the Americans develop an airborne force that is unequaled in the world. And they develop this other idea, this competing idea of vertical envelopment and strategic mobility that competes with the Army Air Force idea of strategic bombing. That's why glider, the glider program grows. That's why the glider pilots and glider units grow. Now, whenever you think of airborne operations in World War II, you think of things like this. You see this iconic picture. This is General Eisenhower, hours before D-Day, talking with paratroopers from the 101st Airborne Division. These are not guys who are riding gliders. They're falling out of airplanes. Right? These are some uh, high-strung paratroopers from the 101st Airborne Division who are obviously painting themselves in their Mohawk uh, war paint. Okay? Again, paratroopers. You're thinking airborne, you're thinking paratroopers. And then most recently, we have once again another in the long array of propaganda for the 101st Airborne Division, <laughs> Band of Brothers. Okay? Now, if you go to Fort Bragg, <coughs> Fortress Bragg, as we like to call it, uh, where the, the home of the 82nd Airborne Division, America's only airborne division, you're going to see this poster. This is ubiquitous. This is everywhere at Fort Bragg. This is a great recruiting poster. There's this is in the division headquarters. It's in the division commander's office. It's in the 82nd Airborne Division Museum. It's in every regiment, every brigade, every battalion. This poster, this epitomizing the, the airborne effort of World War II, guess what? This guy is not a paratrooper. This guy is a gliderman. He's a member of the 325th Glider Infantry Regiment, the 82nd Glider Infantry Regiment during the Second World War. Now, why do I bring this up? Because the 82nd doesn't win without glider pilots and glider infantry and glider artillery and glider anti-tank. Just have a gentleman here I met whose dad was it was in the 80th. Uh, it's, uh, it started out as an anti-aircraft battalion. It gets converted into an anti-tank battalion. 
These guys come in by glider and they bring the staying power, the firepower that the 82nd and 101st and all the other airborne divisions need to succeed. This guy is a gliderman and it's him that stops the Germans, he that stops the Germans at the Battle of the Bulge, not paratroopers. Now what did these guys ride in? Now here I'm getting a little shaky ground because there's a picture of a glider here. Now, this is the most ubiquitous glider, the CG4A, right? And as I said, uh, if, you, if you see Philippe afterwards, he'll actually show you how flimsy is the material that these things are made out of. You see the, the troopers riding into battle on these things? Remember I said the nose swung up? I think the nose swings up, the nose is swinging up there and either loading or unloading that stuff. And you would fly these things into battle. And you fly them by the hundreds. And so we return to this slide. And we see hundreds or thousands of these gliders that would be deposited on the, air, on the battle zone. And the four major operations here, the four major assault operations, Neptune, which is D-Day, Dragoon, the invasion of southern France, Market, our Operation Market Garden, to jump into Holland, and then Varsity, the jump across the Rhine, gliders played an important part. But the other thing that they do is, is these are demonstrations of this idea of vertical envelopment coming into the enemy's rear from the air and strategic mobility. Do you know before D-Day, did the Germans know where the Allies were going to land? No, they didn't. In fact, Hitler thought, does anybody know what Hitler's best guess was? Calais. No, Calais, that was his second best guess. His first guess was Norway. Norway. You know why? Because he was afraid of these guys appearing anywhere. Anywhere. Now, I told you I was going to talk about Burma. Burma is an unusual case. Wingate's Chindits, they were these long range penetration group. They went went behind Japanese lines and you had to keep them supplied so that they would fly in these gliders. They didn't have very many gliders, maybe what, 160, 200 gliders, something like that. And these guys would fly in and, uh, and deliver supplies. They'd also deliver mules, fly mules. You know, uh, as an aside, I wasn't going to tell the story, but hell, I'm here, let's do it, okay? You know, the 82nd is preparing for the Sicily drop in North Africa. And uh, they're going to use no gliders. All the gliders are going for the British, for the British operations on the uh, eastern side of Sicily. The 82nd is only going to be a parachute operation. Well, they, can, they have an artillery piece, a 75 millimeter pack howitzer, that can be dropped from an aircraft. But that's the only thing that can be dropped. That's the heaviest weapon that can be dropped. And it's only going to work assuming a lot of ifs. If it all drops out of the aircraft, if you can find all the pieces, right, because you've got to break it down into different pieces, if you can put them together in time, and if you can do all that before the Germans find you. A lot of ifs there, right? But they figured that we're going to get these things, and these 75 millimeter pack howitzers are designed for mules anyway, so let's see if mules can parachute. It's a true story. So I actually talked to the guy who was in charge of this, a fellow by the name of Mark Alexander, who was a battalion commander of the, uh, in the 505th during this uh, jump. And, uh, and uh, Alexander says, yeah, we got him on the plane, coaxed him on the plane, no problem, got him up to altitude, no problem, and then we pushed him out, and they, those damn things just didn't want to go. <laughs> you think? <laughs> and then when they, the mules, because they're mules, you know, they get close to the ground, and, and anybody, uh, anybody, I've got one or two parachute jumps under my, uh, under my belt, and the, th the last thing you want to do when you land is lock your knees. You don't want to lock your knees because you're going to break your legs, right? Well, what do mules do? They see the ground coming up, they lock those legs, so they break all their legs. So it wasn't a very successful experiment. And then when the, Cic when the, uh, when the 80, uh, 505 got to Sicily, they found out that there are more mules per square inch in Sicily than any place in the world. <laughs> okay. But these guys in Burma, they brought in mules for these chinzits to use as pack animals. They also brought out the wounded. So here's the deal. You'd have a couple of these gliders. First of all, the chinzits at these pre-alleged places, they'd, they would hack out of the jungle, the Burmese jungle, a, a, a place that was flat enough and free of obstacles so that these, these glider pilots could land. They'd bring in their gliders, 
They'd unload their stuff, their mules, their supplies, or what have you, and then they would take on board the wounded and sick, and then they'd set up these poles with the tow rope somehow attached to these poles. These, these smart people can tell you how that's done. And then this C-47 would fly with a, like a hook and, and grab and snatch the glider out. That's a good idea. <laughs> but that's what they did. And they did this over and over. And the guys that they saved a lot of were Gurkhas. Now Gurkhas, if you've ever worked with the Gurkhas, they are some of the best soldiers in the world. In fact, they are so good, I'll tell you a little secret. You know who guards the U.S. Embassy in Afghanistan? Gurkhas. Yes. Gurkhas. You feel very safe. I spent quite a lot of time there. You feel very safe with the Gurkhas. So this is the type of stuff that they did in Burma. And we talked about the bulge. Essentially what happened to the bulge, we all know the 101st is surrounded. And as Don said, supposedly they won the war there, won the Battle of the Bulge. Okay. But their medical detachment gets taken out. And an urgent call, call goes out, we need some medicos. We need some surgeons down here because our guys are dying unnecessarily. So these glider pilots, these incredibly great, brave men, they volunteer. They load up some medicos. They go in there. They land well. And then they, then they keep on coming in with the two things, or the, actually the three things, those guys who are surrounded at Bastong need. More medical personnel, fuel, and, and uh, 50T, that's about 50 tons of artillery ammunition. You keep bringing them in and about 60 gliders. So this is an incredible operation. Now, I told you before that I was going to talk about how, how heavily this weighed on the mind of the enemy. This ability that only the Americans can develop of strategic mobility. How that had come, that had clashed with this idea of strategic bombing, but because of people like George Marshall, he said, you're going to give me some gliders. You're going to give me these men, and you're going to give me their machines. On the 17th of September 1944 was D-Day for Operation Market Garden. On that day, Hitler had a conference in his headquarters in East Prussia, the Wolfsvlair. And this is what he said. This thing he's talking about, the airborne operation in, in Holland, is, it, is so dangerous that we have to be clear. It's a, if a disaster happens here, here I am. Here is my entire supreme command. You can see that. Hitler is in East Prussia. That's in Poland, thousands of miles away. He's just witnessed what these gentlemen, the 82nd and 101st and the 1st British Airborne Division have done jumped into Holland, and he's afraid, because of this idea of strategic mobility and vertical envelopment, that a like force is going to descend on his headquarters in East Prussia. That's his major concern. The Germans had to defend everywhere. And as Frederick the Great, another, well, I shouldn't say another great German, a previous, great, uh, previous German ruler said, he who defends everywhere defends nowhere. You can't defend everywhere. But you are made to defend everywhere because of strategic mobility. Now, I've got some final closing comments here. I, uh, I thank you for uh, indulging me. This is essentially what it gives you, unmatched strategic or operational mobility. The Axis powers had to be constantly on guard of where these guys are going to pop up. Large-scale operations, this is you, what you get from airborne operations. But airborne operations don't work unless you have glider units. And glider units don't work unless you have glider pilots. Airborne operations, paratroopers were not heavily enough armed to make that much of a difference. You needed the artillery that the gliders brought in, the anti-tank weapons that the gliders brought in, the supplies that the gliders brought in. And you needed the extra men that the gliders brought in. Strategic mobility works. It works because we have airborne divisions. But airborne divisions only work because we have glider program, despite the fact that the Army Air Force didn't want one. Now, in closing, I'd like to dedicate this to this guy right here. 
Some of you may know him. I, uh, when I was here last time, I met Lester for the first time, a 325th soldier from the 82nd Airborne Division. You can see where he served there. Lester, we lost Lester recently, but uh, he was a good friend. And like I said, I'd like to dedicate this to him. And I thank you very much. I wanted to mention uh, one thing that uh, our first uh, veteran is going to speak about. Uh, last November, uh, PBS contacted our roundtable, and Kermit uh, was part of a D-Day program that aired on like the 28th of uh, May this year. Uh, it's called D-Day's Sunken Secrets. Uh, it's not just about uh, glider operations, but it talks about all of the things that were sunk and under the uh, surface at uh, Normandy. But uh, that is available, and uh, I, I bring that to your attention. The, um, the panel that we have set up this evening is a broad spectrum. We don't expect everything, but I want you to uh, appreciate what these gentlemen have done. Our first speaker is Kermit Swanson. And uh, he was a glider pilot. He flew into Normandy. He flew into Holland. He flew into Varsity. That shows how dumb he was. <laughs> uh, and, and, and he's soon to be 97 years old. It's 96. So man, he did, he did something right, didn't he? George Thys, uh, uh, and, and I, and I want to make a special tribute uh, to George. Uh, George is the organizer of the Glider Pilots Reunion. Our, our next uh, veteran <coughs> uh, was a guy that pulled him. Dick Ford from Washington. Oregon. Oregon, I'm northeast, oh. northwest. <laughs> But uh, we're trying to give a little perspective. Uh, he uh, towed both a single toe, a double toe, and a horsa. And he'll talk about that later. And then Ray Nagel, one of our local guys that you've seen at, at a lot of the events, uh, was in the 321st Glider Infantry, uh, flew into, uh, uh, into Holland. But we're going to move down the line here. I'm going to do a little bit of a, um, an introduction, and then I'm going to ask them a question, and they're going to answer that. Kermit Swanson was in the 437th Troop Carrier Group. Uh, he was born in Dassel, Minnesota, uh, entered the military in June of 1940, was trained at Chanute Field in airplane mechanics, uh, he then went to uh, Goodfellow Field in San Angelo. Uh, he ended up getting his private pilot license. And uh, while he was uh, uh, waiting around to, 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 to get into powered aircraft pilot, uh, he ended up doing dead stick training in Spencer, Iowa, and then went down and got his uh, glider pilot training in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, he, uh, as I mentioned earlier, he flew into Normandy as a co-pilot and uh, into Holland as a pilot and into Varsity. In all three operations, he carried uh, a jeep and four men. Now, Kermit, I, I want you to tell this group, t tell us about your flight into Normandy. Oh, depends on what you'd like to hear. Uh, we didn't know too much about it till we got there. But um, it was a, um, a night mission. We had never tried this in combat. We had done a considerable amount flying around the country in the night without lights. We'd land with um, truck flyers. These little kerosene 
truck flares they used years ago. They'd put them along the driveway, uh, along the runway, and then we'd take a, a um, glider up, and they'd turn us loose about probably three, four miles off, and we came down and landed by those lights. And um, we did all kinds of things. They put up two sticks this way with a, with a string across it. The first string was at a certain height. It was, uh, oh, probably about uh, eight or 10 feet off the ground across the runway. And then about, um, oh, I don't know, 30 yards or so further down, there was another string. Then they take you out back here and they cut you off and you have to come in over the first string land and stop before you get to the next string. And this is the kind of things we were doing. And um, they aren't impossible. It uh, was a lot of fun. But, but how, how did you do it at night uh, at Normandy with the, uh, uh, the, the hedgerows? <laughs> yeah, they didn't have no lights at all. <laughs> and that June 6th was a dark night. Very dark night, low moon, and um, we took off that midnight over in England, flew across the English Channel, came up on the back side. We then go in where the main thrust, everybody, all the American soldiers were on, your, on England. All of them, all the infantry, everything was on that island of England. And everything had to be moved that one night over onto the beaches. And, and so they knew there was going to be a problem because Hitler had it well fortified. So then they took them, decided that it probably would help if they took the gliders and brought them up from behind and the paratroopers, paratroopers did the work. I want to give them the credit. We were just the truck drivers. They were the fighters. <laughs> yeah. And we, they jumped out back to the enemy, back of the beach, about probably uh, 20 miles, and then just as soon as the last paratrooper got down, the gliders began to come in the dark, and landed there. And we had the, their jeeps, we had their uh, anti-tank guns, and uh, we had fuel, we had food, we had medical supplies, ammunition. Yeah, we had ammunition. You know, a paratrooper jumps out and he's got in his pocket, he's got some, probably some candy bars, and he's got a little ammunition in the other pocket, and he lands in the dark, and he don't know where he is or where he's going to go. He's kind of lost, and he isn't going to go very far, because he's got to, he's, there's a lot of things he's going to have if he's going to accomplish his uh, mission. Uh, so. Kermit, uh, one, one time when I, when I first met you on the phone, you uh, described your landing in Normandy. Could you tell about that landing to our audience? Okay, yeah. Um, it, was, it was like I said, uh, it was a dark night, and we flew over there, and, uh, and you, you get, when you come to the, where you're going to light, uh, Tow plane has got two lights on its tail. It's got actually three lights on the vertical part of the tail. There's an amber light and a green light and a red light. And the, the amber light is on all the time, so you can see kind of where that tail is at. But anyway, when the green light comes on, you're entering the, the drop zone. Now, the paratroopers had just gone in here to the same area, supposed to be so, in a five-mile circle, and now the now the uh, comes the gliders, and they are supposed to land in that five-mile circle. And as this, as the tow plane pulls the glider over that circle, the red light will come, or the green light comes on. That means you can now's the time to cut off. And it's so dark when you look down, you couldn't know you didn't know where you were or how high you were or anything else more than an altimeter. You cut off. And you start down. You're gonna make you're gonna make a three quarters of a turn circle, and then you're gonna be down. It's gonna take you about oh, we were flying at 500 feet. Always flew at 500 feet. We flew low, so that uh, the bigger guns couldn't get at you. So you go over the people pretty fast. That was the 
So you now you are un unhooked. You have probably three or four minutes of your life left. It's, <laughs> it's dark down there. And um, you had four guys sitting in that Jeep back there. You were responsible for them, too, you know. And um, it kept on going down. The co-pilot was calling off the airspeed and the altitude. That's all you needed to know. You had to maintain about 80 miles an hour airspeed or you're going to start to fall. That meant you kept on going down. You know? And, um, and uh, he was telling you how high it was, you know, so if you knew he was going to make another turn. And um, you just sat there. And first thing I knew was I hit a tree in the dark. I hit it with my right wing. Uh, my co-pilot, uh, my pilot did. I was calling off their speed and stuff for him. And uh, we didn't see it or anything. And you hit the ground. It had turned us kind of kitty corner this way. Oh, you're doing fine. Yeah. It turned us on an angle. And when you hit the ground, the wheels came off. And then you had some skids underneath there, so you slid to a stop. And when we slid to the stop, and it stopped, it got awful quiet. There is no motors or anything in there, and it's dark. And I asked, anybody hurt? And the guy said, not back here. And just then, a cow bellowed real loud. <laughs> we knew we were in the cow pasture. <laughs> That's all we knew was we were in the cow pasture. That's the way we landed in Normandy. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, uh, there is Kermit by the, uh, the, the Dassel Dispatch, named after the honor of the town that he grew up in. <laughs> Okay, our, our next veteran, George Tice. Did I do it right that time? Gosh. Uh, George was born in uh, Denton, Maryland in 1924. And Saturday, he'll be 90 years old. Happy Amazing birthday. Now. Graduated from uh, high school in... Uh, Salisbury, Maryland. Uh, my son's roommate at uh, the Air Force Academy was from Salisbury. Uh, he enlisted in 1942 in the reserve. Uh, he uh, got his uh, civilian pilot training at Lynchburg College, uh, did his uh, service pilot training at Burlington, Vermont. January 1944, he uh, did his uh, instructor pilot training and did dead stick. Uh, January 44, he went to Shepherd Field for basic. Uh, September of 44, uh, South Plains in the class of 4413. Uh, then went to uh, Larnberg Maxton in North Carolina, where he, uh, in November of 44, did the snatch and grab that, uh, that uh, Guy talked about. And then uh, sailed on January of 45 on the Ile de France, Six days, landed in Scotland, uh, went uh, to um, Orléans, France, and from there participated in the, as a glider pilot into uh, Operation Varsity. Uh, George, could, could you tell us about your, uh, uh, your takeoff, your landing, and, and uh, Varsity? On uh, about 8 o'clock a.m., on the 24th of March, I participated in Operation Varsity from a little airfield called Brissy near Orleans, France. I was number 84 out of 90 gliders that were participating from the 440th Troop Carrier Group. I carried in a Jeep and four troopers, and I was number three in an echelon of four. I carried a Jeep, the number one glider in the echelon carried a Jeep, Number two had an anti-tank gun or a howitzer, and number four had a jeep trailer. And we were supposed to land nose to tail so we could unload and become a, a team of two jeeps 
an artillery piece and some ammunition. When we started to cross the Rhine River, about three and a half hours in flight, uh, we were a little high. I think we'd elevate, we'd gone up about a thousand feet because the glider train started to get uh, uh, packed because of some uh, delays along the, the uh, join up of the other troop carrier groups along the way. Now that day there were 1,300 gliders in the air, including the British. We had about 880 or so. Uh, as we crossed the Rhine River, we could not see anything below us except smoke. The American army was, fought, was uh, with smoke generators, were trying to protect the assault across the river by boat, and they were in the process of trying to build a pontoon bridge. And so we could not see anything because the smoke was blowing over the landing zone. So when we got to the point where the pilots navigator thought we should be cutting loose. We got the green light in the Astrodome. Number one glider disconnected, made an immediate left turn. Number two was supposed to follow. Number three, I was number three to follow. And number four was to follow me. And we all were lo losing altitude using our spoilers. And when we got to the second turn, uh, we were still losing altitude. The third turn was really not a turn. It was a nose-high slip, sli side slip, allowing us to lose a lot of altitude without picking up a lot of speed. And then prior to making impact to the ground, I could see the, the land uh, at that time. We broke broken through the smoke. And I remember seeing a church steeple, and I thought I was going to run into it, but it turns out it was not as close as I thought. But when I continued to land in a nice field, there were no obstructions on the field. There were very few gliders. It looked like it was there all alone. And I landed normally. The only damage to the glider was the tail wheel broke, tail wheel broke somewhere on the impact. Uh, as soon as we dropped, uh, touched the ground, we landed with brakes full on, skidding with the nose down and the tail in the air till we came to a halt. Our per first job was to get out of the glider and get the Jeep out, and then we were to be separated. The airborne would go in their direction once the load was connected, and then we would follow and try to find our command post to check in for assignment. Well, it turns out the airborne had to put props on the tail to hold it up to keep the nose down, and then the Jeep driver would start the engine and drive forward and he had a cable, there was a cable connected to the rear bumper of the Jeep, which went through a series of pulleys overhead and pulled the nose up, which had been released. When that was almost up, the Jeep, the props swayed and, and fell down, the tail fell, which was disastrous because it caused the nose to, to come loose and drop down on the hood of the Jeep. So there we were, the Jeep caught with the hood, <laughs> with the hatch. So the airborne got out and lifted the, the hatch. I helped, helped on one side. And the Jeep driver was able to start the engine and go on out. But he had to jump, drop off the end because the ramps were not up where they should have been. Uh, the landing was, I would call, textbook complete. There was no damage. I don't remember hearing a, a, a small arms fire. I don't remember seeing any flak going in. All these people that went into other landing zones were heavily hit by shrapnel, or flak, I should say, and the 88 would shoot them out of the air like ducks. So after that, we were supposed to get the airborne on their way. Never did find the Jeep trailer. Turns out the Jeep trailer glider had his aileron shot up to where he could not make turns. So he, he lost altitude and went straight ahead, and there was an alpha orchard, and he happened to land between the trees, and of course the, the trees knocked his wings off. But he wasn't hurt, but we didn't have the Jeep, so the Jeep, I didn't have the trailer, so the Jeep driver found another vehicle, I think it was a, another a Jeep trailer, and he took off. That's the last I saw of the Airborne. Now, my co-pilot apparently I got separated from it, I don't recall how, and so I was walking by myself down the road looking for what I considered some checkpoints to find the command post for assignment. 
And as I was approaching a farm yard with a brick stone or stone uh, fence around the, the farm yard, there was a general officer standing next to a glider pilot that I had gone through training with. And the, the glider pilot saw me and called me over. He said, hey, George, come over here. Where's your map? I said, map? Damn it. I left the map in the, in the, G, in the glider because it was busy getting out of there. And I didn't really think about the map. Uh, so the general says, well, I would appreciate if you'd go back and get your map. I said, yes, sir. So I turned around. It turns out that general officer was not part of the airborne organization, the 17th. He was one of two general officers that were high level staff officers, Fort Benning and so forth that wanted to go overseas and participate in an airborne mission to get some combat experience. They weren't even assigned an organization. So this general had no map, no aides, no nothing but, but his pack on the back. And he had dropped in the wrong drop zone. <laughs> so I, I turned around and headed back to the glider to get my map. And as I was going through some hedgerows, uh, bushes, out come two general, two German soldiers with their hands up, yelling, comrade, comrade. So here I was, 19-year-old kid, and he were, they were about the same age. He was, they were about as scared of me as I was them. And they had their hands up. I didn't, couldn't see any weapons, so I said, come in the air, come with me. So I marched them out to the glider. As we were approaching the glider, I saw another airborne guy coming along, and I said, hey, buddy, do me a favor. Would you hold your gun on these guys while I take their picture? So I had, so I had these two Germans standing beside my glider, and you can see it was in perfect condition, you know, except that the nose had not come down properly, and it was caught with the wheel chocks. And so I got that picture, and it's one of my favorites. And if you Google my name, George Tice, on the internet, you will see my glider with those two Germans standing their hands in the air. George, could you pass it back to Kermit? Kermit. Just a moment. Oh. oh, let me tell you one, one thing. More? All right. What happened to the two Germans? Oh. You didn't let me tell that. No, tell it. I headed back toward the general with a map and the two Germans, and along comes another jeep with uh, an MP collecting prisoners. And they said, hey, Lieutenant, I'll take them off your hand. I said, thank you, and away they went. So I went down to see the general to give him the map, and he said to me, Lieutenant, and I was just a flight officer at that time. I don't think he knew, he knew the difference. <laughs> and he said, I want you to stay with me and be part of my staff. So I said, Mr. General, sir, my orders are to report to the command post for assignment. And Bill Stone, who was the glider pilot, said, George, you go back and report me in, and I'll stay with the general. And so they did. He did. And later on, I, Bill told me that the general gave him the Bronze Star. <laughs> and that's the end of my story. The rest was routine. Uh, Kermit, I, Kermit, I, I want you to talk about your landing in varsity. Oh no, varsity, varsity is a crossing the Rhine. Oh, crossing the Rhine. Well, that's the, the Rhine River is a, the a big river, and it's um, the it's the boundary between Germany and uh, I don't know Holland, Belgium there, and. Um, the Americans had, had pushed the Germans up to the Rhine, and when they got up there, the Germans quickly jumped over the Rhine and got on the other side and blew up the bridges, and, um, and then they challenged the Americans to come to see if they could come over. And um, that's when they used the gliders again and the paratroopers. Then, then about a few days later, the paratroopers and the gliders came and we flew right over the in right in the middle of the day right over the Rhine River at 500 feet you know and they all could take a shot at you and went back about 
oh, four or five miles and found a place to land. How, and, how was your landing at, uh, at Vesel? Oh, the landing was, wasn't too bad, but my co-pilot had passed out because um, uh, we got hit pretty hard. First shot hit right in the tail, and I lost my rudder, but that I didn't need. The next shot hit just a little ahead of that, and there was, that's tubing and stuff in there. The third shot hit underneath the Jeep and exploded, and it blew the tires and fuel tank and everything. And the fourth shot hit... Put it closer to you, Mark. Closer. The fourth shot, fourth shot hit right underneath our co-pilot. We were sitting on pieces of armor plate that they'd put in a steel armor plate they'd put in the seats, and then we had a cushion we sat on. Then we had flak suits on. And um, the flak suits will stop some of the shrapnel. It won't uh, stop at all. The first shot hit underneath, it came up from underneath, and hit right, un that right underneath my co-pilot's seat and exploded out, and it caught me in this right leg. It really thrashed his legs, just hanging straight down right by the explosion. And I got it in the arm, and I had, I had so tough. I must have had my head turned this way and was talking to him, and one of the pieces ripped my cheek open here, and it didn't go through, so it bled on the inside, but um, it just kept on going. But here you are, you know, back of the enemy lines. You ain't going to see a medical doctor or anything for several days. And um, we landed and we patched him up pretty well. We had uh, quite a time. He, he was bleeding bad. And uh, we had to put tourniquets on to stop the bleeding. And uh, we, got, uh, we saved him until we got him to a doctor so a couple, two, three days later. So you, you, you had a little bit rougher landing than uh, George did. <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's pretty much typical, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Either they hit a tree or they hit something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, could you pass the mic down to, uh, to Dick? <clears throat> uh, Dick Ford was in the 315th uh, Troop Carrier Group, uh, 310th Squadron, was born in California, uh, worked on a newspaper for a while, became a a firefighter, February 43, uh, uh, went into the military. Uh, he did his primary at uh, Cal Aero in California, did his basic at La, La Moore, California, uh, <clears throat> then got into, uh, flew B-25s, twin engine planes in Colorado, uh, went to Bergstrom Air Force Base in Texas and flew C-47s. Uh, he shipped out on the USS America, uh, arrived in uh, Liverpool in July of 1944, uh, did some training at, uh, at Spanhole uh, for uh, Market Garden, and on uh, September 17th, uh, he uh, dropped paratroopers at the Grave Bridge. If any of you remember that... Uh, uh, one of the really important uh, operations uh, in the capturing of that bridge at Grave. Uh, the weather was bad the next few days, but on September 21st, he dropped the, uh, the Polish Airborne at uh, Arnhem on the south side of the river, if you remember that story. Uh, he uh, uh, after Market Garden, he flew uh, supplies, if you remember the old story, gasoline to Patton. Uh, he flew gasoline into Lor Lorraine, su supporting the Third Army advance across Lorraine, and, uh, and then uh, relocated to Amiens in April of 45 to help bring troops back. Uh, Dick had a unique experience in uh, doing single toes on CG4s, double toes on CG4s, and towing horses. Dick, I'd like for you to tell us about what it's like to take off with a glider as a single, a double, and a horse. Thank you. I'll stand up so you can see me. I'm short. <laughs> uh, we normally... Uh, 
towed rather I mean uh, took paratroopers rather than land uh, than uh, towed gliders. One of the reasons I think is that we were the only troop care group to be awarded the Distinguished Service Medal for the being on time and on target in Normandy. So we always figured we were going to be guinea pigs for something. And that's where we got into gliders. When we first uh, got into gliders, as a matter of fact, when we moved into Spano, where we lived, we got into a Quonset hut that had already had two glider pilots in it. So we were associated with glider pilots all the time we were there. However, I learned how to play bridge at 10 cents a point, thanks to a glider pilot. When in towing a glider, you line up on the runway, nose to tail almost, and you're in the middle of the, on one side of the runway with a glider behind you. Staggered on the other side is a glider, I mean it's a propane, and the glider. So actually what's happening is the first plane, this is a 6,000 foot runway, half of it is loaded with gliders and, and the planes. When the first plane took off, takes off and hits, takes a glider, as soon as it gets to the end of the runway, the next one does. And this goes all the way through the whole squadron, the whole group or whatever it is. That's not bad, but the tow plane is already accelerating, and that cord or cable between us is 175 feet long. So it's beginning to take that strain off, and uh, um, when it gets airborne, it, the glider flies a lot earlier. You'll see him always above you. He'll never fly below you because that's where the, tur the turbulent prop wash is. So they're always above you. And you can see him uh, as you look, look back. We have a whole uh, observation point over the uh, center of the aircraft. That's no real problem except that when you get up in the air, you must maintain space. You get a uh, hundred and, I guess it was a hundred, yeah, over a hundred feet of clearance from everything, from the other planes ahead of you, from the glider ahead of you, or where it may be. You flew formation, one, two, three, and you're always 100 feet apart. But the gliders, of course, are now back here, 175 feet behind you. That's for the single. With a double toe, it gets a little more complicated. Instead of being in the side of a runway, you're in the middle of the runway, and a glider is on the right side, and a glider is on the left side. Same distances, but different regulations. You now tow, one of those gliders is 90 feet, 75 feet behind the other one. So there's always 100 feet separation between the gliders and, the, and then the tow plane, of course, is more than that. In the formation, you're not straight across, but actually you're in a V formation, just like you'd be if there was no glider. That was complicated. But in our practice, we would do it empty, and we would do it loaded. So when we had double tow gliders, we were actually being... Um, about 120 miles an hour is all we could make. Single engine airspeed for that C-47 was 120 miles an hour. You didn't dare get off base, and when you had below 120, of course, you are basically on the margin of not being able to fly properly. So we'd always put on extra power and try to get above maybe 125. The other position was the Horsa glider. The Horsa is a monster towed by a British Sterling uh, aircraft, and it would weigh about three times as much as, or carry about three times as much as our uh, one glider would. We towed that one, 
And when that one was loaded, we couldn't even get to 120 miles an hour, but we managed to fly and drop them and get and back. So we were always grateful that we were not a part of the glider operation, but always the tow. Our, in our supply missions and everything else we did, we flew formation. Everywhere a C-47 went, it was in formation with others. That formation was extremely tight. I was fortunate that I was recognized as being a good uh, wingman. So I would usually fly on the right side of the lead, squadron lead, which means I was in the second aircraft and close to him. We were supposed to always stay outside his wingtip to our wingtip and our nose behind his tail. That wasn't fun. I would come in and get inside that where I had to always stay above him, same thing, prop wash, but it was boring sometimes. At one, at one instance, it was a long trip, and I was getting bored, so I knew the, the squadron lead. So I moved in. Everybody now is watching me as my plane moving in got my left wing tip and tapped his fuselage. I'm, about that time, this, there was a sea, uh, uh, captain. He looked and saw me laughing at him. He just run like that. And so we did get confident. We did feel confident. And uh, I enjoyed flying. I did get the uh, fly glider. Uh, I, I don't like to be pulled. I like to do the pulling. Uh, to drop a glider, it was, you saw the lighting. Uh, normally, if he was in trouble, he would pull the, the release. If the plane got in trouble, he had to recognize it and pull a release. Because any time that, that cord was not t tense, it would, he couldn't release it. It wouldn't release. So if uh, our plane was bad, then fine. But if, if that slack ever got, got there, he couldn't release. So we had to make sure that we never released except when he was af after he had released. Because otherwise, if we pulled the release, all that cable would go right back into his face. So. It was up to the glider to keep us healthy. Thank, thank you so much. Dick. Uh, Ray, uh, Ray Nagel was in the 321st Glider Field Artillery, 101st Airborne, and, and he told me that he was part of the 101st that won the war yeah, guy. <laughs> Ray is from... Uh, Minnesota. Uh, when he went into Normandy, they did not have enough gliders. Ray went over on the Susan B. Anthony, landing on, uh, headed for Utah Beach. The Susan B. Anthony hit a mine, and so Ray had to swim ashore, right? No, no, he got ashore. But he did not come into, into, uh, Normandy in a glider. Into Holland, he did come into uh, the Market Garden exercise uh, campaign in a glider. Ray, uh, tell us about your flight in Market Garden in the glider. Yeah, my wife's uh, going to take, take, take over because <coughs> I can't talk. Yeah, uh, but I, I do, I do want to say this. Both Dick and Ray just got back from celebrating the 70th anniversary of Market Garden. I'd also like to point out that I was privileged to actually interview and talk to the King of Netherlands and also to the President of Poland just as an American pilot. I was the only American pilot to be in Arnhem, Drill, Osterbeek, 
or the cemeteries and the commemorations from the U.S. Air Force. And so it was quite an honor. Yeah. And how many, uh, when uh, Helen, you and Ray went to, with, with the ground part of it, how many uh, 82nd, 101st uh, airmen were there for the 70s? Well, it's just a guess of ours. Um, the greatest generation from Denver brought in about 11 veterans. And um, there were a couple others scattered around, kind of like Ray. And then um, some of the little towns had uh, veterans there, but they only stayed in their little town. So I would say we saw about 14. And, and I do want to do this disclosure. Uh, Ray had some serious medical problems, which is the reason that Helen is helping him this evening. Uh, no, I was the glider pilot in Baston. <laughs> Oh, okay, let's talk about the uh, the uh, uh, your flight as a part of the 321st into Holland in a glider. Okay, um, Ray dictated this message, so I will try to deliver it as best as I can. I'm not perfect like he is, but I'll do my best. Um, and he's open for questions afterwards. Ray was a gunnerman in the 75 Hauser, and he set the sight, elevation, and deflection. Um, he knew something was going on because nobody was getting a pass near September 17th. So that was kind of a clue that something was uh, heading their way. And uh, September 16th, they got information to load up. So his job was to have his crew load the 75 Hauser, and they took about um, 400 pounds of ammunition, and some of it was on the gun and the floor, and they tied all of this down with a special knot in order to hold it down, but also to make it easy to unload quickly when they landed. Five glidermen were in with the pilot and co-pilot. In other gliders, it would be a jeep with the same staff and five glidermen. Otherwise, it would be 18 glidermen. The paratroopers left at 5 a.m. <coughs> pardon me, without any artillery. So they had um, early breakfast and were planning to leave at 7 a.m. But they were so fogged in that they had to wait until the fog lifted. So they had another lunch and they left at 11 a.m., fog or no fog. We could not see the 350 tow rope pulling our glider. We had a flight of 60 gliders plus 60 C-47s towing us. The first mishap was when one of the C-47 pilots got out of formation and crossed our tow rope and started to pull the two gliders together. Remember, each glider had approximately 84-foot um, wingspan. The C-47 pilot saw what was happening and pulled back into formation. Luckily, the pilot went off over the top of their tow rope, untwisting the rope instead of underneath, or we would have been in the English Channel. Our second mishap was when the C-47 slowed down because it was running into a glider, and we were 50 feet above, remember we're four ton now, looking down at the C-47 uh, pilot, and he's looking up with no communication. Um, then he looked down and took off for France, tightened up our glider rope, gave the glider a heck of a jerk, 
and luckily the tow rope did not break. I think it was a maximum speed of about 150 knots, maybe not so. Our glider was just shaking. We caught up with the flight by the time we got to Holland. So co-pilot um, were taken away in England. So Ray did take some training in that area and he was sitting in front. So once they got up in the air, he could be a co-pilot for about an hour. And it took three and a half hours to get to Holland. When arriving in Holland, all 60 gliders cut loose, going about 120 miles an hour, landing in a potato field near Best and Zahn. What a mess when 60 gliders cut loose. We lost lots of glidermen right in the landing. Our section met in one area, started unloading the gun. The Jeep had a very hard time finding the um, uh, right gun to pick up, and we were being shot at at the same time. We found our location at Zahn, asking a 14-year-old boy, um, showed him the map and said, we need to go over there. And he just said, well, go right and down the road and take another right and you'll be in San. He should have never been there because we did later hear that some 16 and 17 year old um, children, boys got killed because they were on that field. Um, three German tanks had already destroyed the bridge that they were going to protect in Zahn, and the Germans had taken off because Ray thinks that they heard that the artillery just landed. Well, Ray's five-day mission lasted 69 days. He loved the Dutch people so much, he used to say that they were better than family, and I said, be careful where you say that. Helen, thank you for helping Ray with that. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, the other thing I, I do want to add to it, I talked to Herb Seurth. You know Herb Seurth is in the 506th, and Ray's 321st was supporting the 506th, and Herb wants to be on the program in December when we're doing a Battle of the Bulge topic. So Ray and Herb Seurth were together both in Holland and on the north shoulder of the uh, uh, bulge at Bastogne. Uh, we're going to turn over, transition to question and answer, but give these folks. When you say that uh, you did some of the, uh, the parachute drops, did you uh, ever parachute any of the Scottish troops at all? No, we dropped uh, the British first, we dropped the 82nd, we dropped the Poles, we dropped the British 6, we made a landing uh, at the tail end of the Market Garden, and then we also made a supply drop, but never the Scottish troops, only the first and the second British. I want to ask a question. Um, I heard about hauling jeeps, I heard about hauling artillery pieces in gliders. But that was only part. A jeep had to have a trailer. An artillery piece had to have ammunition. How did you find all that stuff when it lands in a field? We, we had a lot of jeeps in the, in the gliders. In fact, I, I think that um, oh, three-fourths of the gliders had a jeep in it. And they had a jeep, and uh, then they had a... a uh, Folding trailer, just a regular trailer, but you put the, the collapse the pole and then you set the wheel or set it upright and fasten it to the walls. And this this trailer was for these for hauling the supplies. Once it got on the ground, now you had this, all these supplies in here. How were you going to move them? You had to have the jeep and you had to have the trailer, and you took brought that and pretty soon the 
and the paratroopers would get a find you, and then they'd take you. And that's the way it was supposed to work. After you landed, uh, what was the plan for the gliders? Were they just left for the locals to uh, salvage or scavenge? Oh, most of the family was nothing left to have any value. <laughs> But I know what happened to a lot of them afterwards, uh, these Hollanders, these Dutchmen, but they liked that glider out there. They had nice big balloon, balloon tires on it that made awful good trailers. So <laughs> they they used them. George, you have a... There were a lot of fence posts in Germany that were formerly wing spars out of gliders. A lot of the people went out and and took whatever they could salvage off the gliders, and a lot of them were were perfect condition for perfect landing like mine. And I'm quite sure that mine was one that was a candidate to be snatched out of of uh, Germany. But there were a lot of a lot of gliders that were uh, salvaged and uh, by the, the Germans, and they really liked some of the plywood and the, the, the steel uh, posts, uh, uh, steel uh, fuselage. Well, uh, th th this is something that I haven't heard before, but when, when uh, Jim and, and, and the guys there in the fourth row were rebuilding our CG4 that's now out at Fagan, uh, we are told that there's a couple of garages in South Minneapolis that were made out of uh, the, the structural walls of, of, of the wings uh, because uh, the story from the uh, glider pilot uh, workers said that one day they said, we're stopping gliders, get out of here, take anything you want to. And so that's what happened. Uh, oh. the, the glider that is in the Silent Wings Museum in Lubbock, Texas, was a, sol was a surplus glider, probably sold by the Army uh, in one of their auctions. And a guy bought that glider and put it on top of a tire company as an advertisement tool. And our group got together and decided they wanted to build a glider for the museum. And they bought that glider off of the roof, took it off the roof, and it's now in, in the completely re uh, re restored, and it's in our museum in, in Lubbock, Texas. And, and I, don't, I don't know, uh, Don Abbey came up from the museum in Lubbock f for the uh, museum. Can I add one, one thing to what was been said? Asked about the gliders when they were down. If a glider was in good shape or could be repaired readily, particularly on the uh, beaches of uh, Normandy, they would uh, rig, uh, lay up the, line up the uh, glider parallel to the uh, sand, and there was an erected system of, looked like a, a football uh, um, goal post. And the C 47s, every squadron had one that had was called a G ship, which meant glider, tow. So when you would approach this uh, glider from the rear, the, the, oh, a hook on the left side of the plane would be screwed down. It was about uh, 20, 20 feet long. That glider, the tow plane, would fly low over the glider, hook it on where the tow rope was actually a head, a hitch to the glider, and pull it off at uh, on the runway. We would be flying at about 145 miles an hour, 150, when we picked up the, the cord. And when we moved forward on that, if you were not exactly straight flying away, you would lose 15 miles an hour just strictly from the jar and you can imagine what that was to the glider pilot as well so we picked up a great number of them and we'll bring them back to england uh one story one of your great uh, pilots uh, tim bailey was was a great help in us getting parts for the glider that these guys built here and uh, 
I do want to tell this story uh, about the uh, supplying the Chindons. He was in the first Air Commandos. Uh, they were hauling mules in. In, in fact, the, the, there's a picture in pack mules. Pack mules. There's a picture in the Morazic book that Axel has in the lobby of three or four of them with with the bar across. But Tim Bailey told the story that uh, the mules got excited in in the glider. And they stamped their, their feet and stamped their way through the uh, cargo platform so that when they landed, the mules were on their bellies, their arms were through the floor. Of course, the, the arms were broken, so they had to be destroyed. But uh, uh, in those days, I think it was about anything goes. Is that right? Yeah. On any glider that was carrying pack mules, they always had one airborne of a soldier with a rifle and instructed to shoot the, the pack mules if they started to be kicking. That's, that's what happened because of the thing you're talking about. I have a question for any of the gentlemen or Mr. Day or Mr. Esplin. I have a, a, a quote or a statistics from the Mission Detroit where they brought in the 80th uh, Airborne Artillery at 4 in the morning. Uh, let's see, it's 52 gliders landed at 4 a.m., 6 intact, 19 damaged, 22 destroyed, and 5 missing. Is that correct? You talk about the Detroit mission, right? Correct. The thing is, um, you've got to remember that the, the two first glider missions that arrived in Normandy arrived uh, on the other side of the coast, um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the west part of the Continental Peninsula. And what has happened is, is they already received small arm fires from the, uh, the, the islands, you know, uh, Alderney and Guernsey. And then as soon as they arrived uh, uh, above the, the coastline, they also received some, uh, some flak fire. And uh, some of them, f when you say that five were missing, it's more, it, that's more, even more than that. Because you've got eight gliders that are cut their rope between the, the coastline and, and, and the landing zone. And they are 25 miles away from the landing zone. So um, th th those, especially the 437th Troop Career Group, even worse than the 434, uh, will receive a heavy uh, arm fire. And uh, quite a lot of uh, gliders were, um, you know, um, uh, uh, well, crash landed or before touched by the by the by the flag. Quite heavy ca casualty for those guys. Was the combat landing the first landing you made in a glider? How many practice landings did you do before you went over? I had several landings in a glider at Lorenberg Max, and I think the total on my record shows 60. There in one phase, I had. Uh, three snatch pickups in training, and I actually participated in four snatch pickups in recovery of gliders after the after the campaign. We actually recycled the gliders, and they were going to be used if they had needed them, but it turned out they didn't. So we actually just assembled the gliders, snatched them, and carried them back to the depot so that they could be destroyed and have the compasses and the clocks removed. That's about the only thing they salvaged. And, and uh, one time when I was down at the Silent Wings Museum in Lubbock, the, the people down there said that there's always ranchers that are bringing in parts to the yeah. museum that uh, crashed in the area around uh, Lubbock. Listen, let's, uh, let's uh, stop it right now. Come up and s thank these guys for their service, and uh, we'll see you in three weeks. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.